Hi, this is Malcolm Keating, and you're listening to Sutras and Stuff. If you're listening to this podcast as it originally airs, you're probably sitting at home, isolating yourself to avoid a viral contagion. We've only known about viruses for about 200 years. They weren't discovered until the end of the 19th century by Dmitry Ivanovsky, a Russian scientist who studied them in tobacco plants. And even then, he only theorized that viruses existed. He couldn't see them, since they're incredibly small. You could line up 100 bacteria along the side of a grain of salt. And for every bacteria, you could line up 10 viruses. So observing viruses had to wait for electron microscopes. Today, though, in 2020, cartoon images of the coronavirus are everywhere. And we're organizing our life around avoiding the tiny, self-replicating things. We talk about fighting a battle against an invisible enemy, viruses. We wage this war with hand sanitizer and soap and keeping physical distance between our bodies. But this battle metaphor isn't the only way to think and talk about disease and health, where disease is an invasion of something external. Often people talk about disease resulting from something inside the body getting out of balance. So while today's medical doctors might describe your immune system being out of balance with its lymphocytes and white blood cells, past physicians might talk about humors inside of you getting out of balance. These two models, the external and internal, coexist and have for a while. At the present moment, as people are worried about their health across the world, they're reaching out for whatever model seems to help. And that includes Ayurveda, not just in India, but across the world. So I thought I'd talk to someone who studies Ayurveda to help understand what it is and how pre-modern Indian medicine thought about disease. Well, okay. So I, I mean, this basic Sanskrit word, right? Ayur, Ayur, Ayus, life, and Veda meaning science. So my name is Patricia Southoff. I am a postdoc at the University of Alberta as part of the European Research Council funded Ayur Yog project in which we are examining the entangled histories of yoga, Ayurveda, and alchemy. What does the word Ayurveda mean? It appears that it would be, you know, of course, Vedic science, right? Because you've got the word Veda in there. But um, that's actually sort of a later integration. So, you know, like actual Vedic medicine, like in the Atarva Veda, is very different from what came later as Ayurveda. So it, even though it sounds like it's straight out of the Vedas, it's actually a slightly later tradition. Hmm. So when does what we call Ayurveda, when does that begin? And what kind of um, sort of medicine uh, and practices were involved in it? Yeah, it's actually got kind of a tricky history because you've got, so like I said, in the Vedas, you've got this this. Vedic medicine, which is very much about casting out demons and curing illnesses through prayer and injunctions to the deities and things like that. And then Ayurveda sort of develops, you get these notions of the winds or the the humors, sorry. So you have pita, which is vile, kapha, which is phlegm, and vata, which is wind. And those actually appear first in the Pali Canon. So Buddha is talking about these and Buddha is teaching that, you know, monastics need to be carrying basic medicines of things like ghee, butter, oil, honey, molasses. Um, And there appear around the fourth century um, CE, you get monasteries that have these sick rooms. So it does seem like these Buddhist monastics had a somewhat medical treatment. Then you get texts like the Charaka, which bring in those ideas of the humors and expand on them. And the, you know, the textual redaction of them shows that these texts may have very early on just been medical texts and then had more Vedic elements added into them to connect them to the Vedas. In Charaka, the compendium, the Charaka Samhita, there's the question of when it was written and then also when it was compiled, correct? Because it's not as if uh, there's just a fellow named Charika who writes it down and then the text is is just this thing that he's written down. Is that correct? Yeah, I mean, it's like like all early Sanskrit texts. We don't totally know when it was compiled, when it was written, how it was redacted. So 
yeah, it, w- we can't just place a date on it and say, oh, it's from this year. Um, there's Chinese sources that say it's at least the first century of the Common Era. Um, traditionally, it's it's said to be about contemporary or just after the Buddha. So, but of course, that's a quite a big time frame, and we don't actually know when Buddha lived, so it's also kind of vague. <laughs> so the history of it's quite sort of separated, and it co-mingles quite early on. And Charaka. That's sort of how you get this Buddhist influence in there. And then, but it doesn't really stick as a Buddhist influence. It's just the influence stays. And then all of the like, you know, Buddhism part kind of falls away and gets replaced with the names of Vedic deities. I want to get into the relationship with Buddhism and uh, Ayurveda, but maybe let me, let me kind of back up a little bit and ask, uh, Ayurveda is a term that is, is actually used kind of frequently in lots of different contexts in contemporary times, right? And um, I just wanted to start and see if you could say what you think the biggest misunderstandings sort of ordinary folk have about Ayurveda and maybe pre-modern Indian medicine. Um, what are what are some of the the maybe myths that you're you're kind of able to dispel with your historical work? Uh, it's basically the fact that it's just straight from the Vedas. I think most people assume that it's part of the Vedas because it has the word Veda in it. Um, but with modern, I mean, there's also the misconception that modern Ayurveda is like exactly the same as ancient Ayurveda. And of course, there's been lots of changes. Um, the Sushruta Samhita, another Ayurvedic text, focuses a lot on surgery and practical things. And the assumption is that these practices are, you know, exactly the same as they were. But there's been a ton of innovation in medical literature. So just going back to Charaka and Sushrucha misses out on so much innovation and so many new ideas, right? As time goes on, you start to see changes like, you know, the appearance of syphilis or, you know, the the taking of the pulse doesn't come in until the 13th century, which, of course, that's now very much part of Ayurvedic and, and all medical treatment. But it wasn't part of it for a very long time. So there is a ton of innovation that I think people miss when they just go straight back to Charaka and Sushruta. So let me let me pick up on this this uh, sort of idea of innovation, because one of the things that I talked about a couple of weeks ago in the Charaka Samhita is the or this compendium is the process by which people reason and think about medicine. So in the Charaka's compendium, and you can correct me here since you're an expert in this, um, as I understand it, there's a, a lot of initial sort of early discussion of reasoning practices, of debate practices, along with some of these sorts of uh, particular medical techniques. So one question I, I might think about in terms of this idea of innovation is how did practitioners determine if a medicine or a treatment was working, what are some of the kinds of methods that they were using to innovate? You know, trade, I think, was a big part, right? So you get, as soon as you start to get new medicines or new minerals, uh, you start to use them in, in different ways, right? So this the appearance of, of new medicines from outside of the subcontinent are going to influence it. You know, um, the use of mercury. Mercury is not really mined. It's not really mined or found in India. So like, once mercury starts to really come in, that's that's due to connections with other parts of the world. So th- those kind of innovations are really important, just coming from other places. There's, you know, Chinese alchemy is, is a huge topic, and I think that seems to have a subtle influence as well. Um, and then, you know, again, in like the 18th century, you start to get the names of Western diseases coming in. And so treatments for Western diseases. So there's all these new diseases that they have to deal with, right? So they have to... They have to try, and they don't really talk in these texts about the failures. They sometimes sort of warn you, um, especially in the alchemical texts. You know, they're like, if you do this wrong, you could start a really bad fire. Okay, good, good to know. Uh, but they don't really talk about the the failures. They talk more about it's just very straightforward. Of like, this will cure this. This is the treatment for this. So, and they don't really show their work, I guess. <laughs> Hi, everybody. This is Malcolm Keating. When I started this podcast, I had no idea that the world would change so dramatically in just a few weeks. Like many of you, I'm staying home and trying to make sense out of everything that's going on. 
From what I can see, I have a small group of people listening to this podcast from quite a few countries around the world. Uh, so I'd like to put together an episode in which I hear from you and what kinds of things you're reading and thinking about during this time of relative isolation. You can use the Anchor website to send me a voice message. Just click on the little button that says message. You can leave me a message with a question about Indian philosophy, something interesting you've been reading, an idea for a topic I could talk about, or a person I could interview. Or you could also email me at sutrasandstuff at gmail.com, all spelled out, sutras and stuff. I hope to hear from some of you, and I'll use your messages on an upcoming podcast. Thanks, everyone, and be well. So, so then uh, you mentioned syphilis as one, but what other kinds of diseases were described in these texts? Obviously, uh, the texts which were in Sanskrit have certain Sanskrit names, but are we able to kind of map on some of the Sanskrit terms to diseases that we recognize today? What, what kind of diseases are we talking about? Uh, yeah, well, they talk a lot about epidemics because, of course, those are going to be, you know, a very, very important and, uh, <laughs> you know, as we see right now, can have a huge impact on the whole world. Um, they talk about things like insanity, alcoholism, um, eye diseases are a big one, uh, fevers. So, you know, a lot of sort of symptoms, but then also, you know, very much diseases. Um, there's a lot of discussion about um, birth and diseases that a pregnant woman can get. Um, so there's a big focus on, it's, it's a big focus on preventative health as, at the same time as dealing with actual diseases. But yeah, there's, a, there's you know, headaches and alcoholism or things that they can cure. Insanity. They're definitely worried about things like that. But yeah, it's a little bit of everything. So what were some of the healing practices that were found in these texts? For instance, you mentioned that uh, Buddhist practitioners in, in monasteries and nunneries were engaging in healing practices. Um, what are some of the techniques that, that they were using? They were using pretty rudimentary early medicines, like, you know, uh, some plants probably, but the, the actual, what the actual Buddhist monks were supposed to carry was just, you know, ghee and honey, um, oils, things that will act as purgatives a lot of times. So, you know, you purge the disease from your body um, by drinking like hot oil. You purge everything from your body, um, including the disease and then including the foods. And so a lot of the treatment is also like, once you purge all these things from your body, then you have to have this bland diet to build your strength back up slowly. And so with, with the idea of purgation, is this at all similar to the idea of a body having humors as we find in some early, say, medieval European medicine? Yeah, no, it's definitely these, these bile, phlegm, and, and wind are the three humors. Um, ancient Greece has humors as well, but they're, they're somewhat similar, but we can't at this point prove that there's any link between them, but they are somewhat similar ideas coming up around approximately the same time. Um, but yeah, herbal medicines are really important and you get, there's also therapies, right? So like enemas, massages, ointments, surgery. Um, the Sushruta talks about surgery very early on. So they're clearly, you know, doing surgery to get rid of diseased parts of the body or things like that. Currently, there's a lot of emphasis on things like hand washing, keeping appropriate distance from people, right? One of the things that people might know if they know anything at all about uh, these older Indian texts on medicine is discussion of things like uh, purity and distancing from people and sorts of um, individual practices of, of purity. So one question you might wonder is, well, is this because they had some sort of uh, prior awareness of things like contagion between people that are transmitting like that we think of, um, or are they focusing on sort of sanitary practices and isolation for totally different, different reasons? How would you account for that? I think they definitely had a conception of contagion um, because there's tons of 
uh, I did a blog post recently with just a little bit of what it talks about epidemics, but there's an entire chapter in Charaka talking about epidemics, right? And and the epidemics are caused by disease, but they're also inflated by things like corrupt officials. Um, so there is this kind of notion of, you know, the, the ruler, if the ruler is bad, it's sort of like the mandate of heaven. If the ruler is, is corrupt, then illness is probably going to come and overtake the people and spread quickly. But with the, with the cleaning and the isolation, it's really more, I mean, it is sort of like what we're doing now. It's a, it's a preventative rather than curative. So Ayurveda in pre-modern India was not straight out of the Vedas, but was strongly influenced by Buddhism. It was a tradition which continued to change and revise itself over time. There was surgery, herbal treatments, and preventative medicine, along with descriptions of diseases we would recognize today. Next week, in the second part of my conversation with Patricia Southoff, I talk with her more about the relationship between Buddhism and Ayurveda, as well as the moral questions that medical practitioners faced at that time. We talk about the relationship between what's known as Ayurveda today and what Ayurveda has been, as well as how these texts understand what it means to be a physician, how hospitals should be run, how to care for the poor, and more. These are topics which are as pressing today as they were thousands of years ago. 